In the 5th century AD, Britain was the last bastion of Celtic culture in Europe. But even this island stronghold would soon be under threat, and the Britons of the Age of Arthur would soon find themselves swept up in an era of chaos, invasion, heroism and loss. Welcome to our final video on the history of the ancient Celts, where we will cover the story of sub-Roman Britain and the Anglo-Saxon invasions that followed. Do you think you're strong and wise enough to change the fate of the ancient Celts? The sponsor of this video Humankind will give you a chance to test this. Humankind is a turn-based historical strategy game from Amplitude Studios and Sega that you can purchase on Steam, the Epic Store, Stadia or Xbox Game Pass. In Humankind you'll be creating your own history by making a unique civilization from a combination of more than 60 historical cultures. Start as a tribe in the Neolithic era, transition to the ancient period as the mighty Babylonians, become the classical era Celts, add Mongol civilizational traits in medieval and round it all up with British attributes in the early modern period. There are near endless combinations of civilizations. In Humankind you'll face historical events, take impactful moral decisions, make scientific breakthroughs, discover the natural wonders of the world or build the most remarkable creations of humanity. Each match is historically authentic, but it's you who decides how to combine the cultures to build your own vision of the world. Every decision you make, every technology you research, every battle you win will build your fame, and the player with the most fame will win the game. Unlike many other 4x games, Humankind does not only have a great strategic lair, but also offers very interesting tactical battles that take place right on the map. Create your avatar to lead your empire, customize it as you progress, and challenge strangers and friends alike in multiplayer games up to 8 players. Ads like these support our channel immensely and we really like the game, so support Humankind and buy this genuinely unique game via the link in the description. In 410 AD, Alaric and his Goths became the first foreign army to sack Rome since Brennus and the Senones Gauls did so 800 years earlier. That same year, the crippled empire pulled the last of their legions out of Britain, never to return and for the first time in 400 years, all of Albion, for better or worse, was free. The centuries immediately after this departure are known as Sub-Roman Britain. As the Romans took with them their habit of thorough record keeping, this era is largely shrouded in mystery. One thing we know is that even after centuries of Latin occupation, Celtic society was alive and well in Britain enjoying a better fate than its continental cousins. From Cornwall to the Fourth Clyde, the language of Queen Boudicca survived as a variety of P-Celtic dialects, broadly classified as Common Brythonic. Meanwhile, the Q-Celtic tongue of Gaelic continued to thrive in Ireland. Finally, in the Scottish Highlands, the Picts howled their war cries with words that distantly related to the tongues to their south. It is also likely that in more urbanised areas, a form of Latin was still in use as one of the many remnants of Britain's recent imperial past. Indeed, many Britons had grown exceedingly accustomed to Roman comforts, and those habits persisted even after Rome's departure. But how Roman was sub-Roman Britain? Robin Fleming, author of Britain After Rome, poignantly describes this post-imperial world to us. In the year 420, there were still people in Britain who had been born in a world shaped by the structure of empire, people whose early lives had been ordered by Rome's material culture. There were those whose childhood dinners had been served on pewter and glass, and middle-aged men who had been raised in heated villas. Britain had once been connected to a continent-spanning empire whose infrastructure brought them the luxuries of Italy, Egypt and Syria, allowing many Romanized Britons to enjoy an aristocratic station in countryside villas and wealthy cities. But when Rome left, so too did the means to make this way of life possible. Archaeological evidence suggests that in the 5th century, the old world order began rapidly collapsing as former Roman cities either drastically shrunk in size or became ghost towns, while the majority of the island's villas were abandoned. As Romanitas decayed, older Celtic traditions emerged from its carcass. 
Some Britons seemed to have moved back into ancient Celtic hill forts, which had stood abandoned for centuries during Roman rule. This massive shift in standard of living probably hit the south and east the hardest. The transition was probably easier for the Britons of the north and the west, who had never been particularly Romanized. It also stands to reason that the Picts and Gaels, who for the most part had always been on the outside looking in, barely experienced any change to their daily lives in this era. However, we should be mindful of the possibility that the Roman lifestyle did not vanish from Britain as quickly as previously thought. The archaeological record suggests that in the 5th century, traders from as far away as Byzantium and North Africa still braved the long journey, most likely due to the island's valuable tin deposits. It is therefore likely that, for a time, some Romano-Britons used this limited foreign trade to maintain a pale imitation of Roman life. Material culture was not the only aspect of Celtic society undergoing a metamorphosis. In centuries past, Roman Britain had been a land of many gods. Native Celtic deities were worshipped alongside Greco-Latin ones, while gods from the furthest edge of the known world established mystery cults in Britain. These included Isis, an Egyptian goddess, and Mithras, an Iranian god who became popular among Romano-British soldiers. However, by far the most successful religion the Romans introduced to Britain was that of the Levantine carpenter. Christianity arrived on the isle as early as the 200s AD, and by the time Rome abandoned Britain, had become the dominant religion. While the cross spread rapidly through the British Isles, those who lived there never truly forgot their polytheist roots. Even under the pressure of increasing Christian zealotry, pagan cults probably survived throughout and beyond the 5th century. There may have even been some druidic circles still practicing their occult rites in secluded groves, longing for a return of the old ways. Many Celts also incorporated the rituals of their ancestors into their newly Christian lives. One example of this lies in Ireland, where the spring goddess Brigid was rebranded as the exalted Saint Brigid, patron of Ireland. Her feast day coincides with Imbolc, a pagan festival celebrating the coming of spring. Other pagan rites survived Christianization as well, such as the bale fires of Beltane and Samhain, where Brythonic and Gaelic peoples alike would thin the lines between themselves and the other world, known either as Anwin or Tin Anyog, the land where the fairy folk dwelled. In the wake of Roman departure, Britain became a patchwork of petty kingdoms. Remarkably, many of these kingdoms appear to have been formed upon pre-Roman tribal lines, as ancient Iron Age identities re-emerged. Most of these realms are poorly represented in the historical record, but others, such as Powys, Dumnonia, Gwyneth, and Strathclyde, are better attested to by virtue of having endured well into the Middle Ages, as opposed to the ones extinguished much earlier on by a certain wave of Germanic migrations. Our main primary source on the wars of this era comes from an early 6th century monk known as Gildas. His work, titled De Excidio et Conquistu Britanniae, or On the Ruin and Conquest of Britain, tells a vivid story of chaos and invasions. De Excidio was not written by a trained historian, but by a devout Christian clergyman writing a religious polemic. Nevertheless, since Gildas's work is by far the most intact source from this era, historians still find themselves reliant on the old monk's writings. His recounting of the 5th century begins with a scene of immediate havoc. No sooner were the Romans gone than the Picts and the Scots, like worms which in the heat of midday came forth, inspired with the same avidity for blood. At this time, the Picts and Scots were probably still predominantly pagan, which would explain why Gildas speaks of them so scathingly. The monk's story continues when the Romano-Christian Britons beset upon by the relentless raiding of their savage cousins, sent a plea to the declining Roman Empire. The barbarians drive us to the sea, the sea throws us back on the barbarians, thus two modes of death await us, we are either slain or drowned. Of course, the Romans, only a few decades away from the final collapse of their empire, 
could offer no salvation. Gildas tells a visceral tale, but his narrative of a victimized Christian people in the face of pagan barbarity is most likely tilted. The Romano-Britons were probably just as warlike as their Celtic cousins, all too willing to invade their neighbors, regardless of the shared culture, language, or faith. With that said, there is some truth to the monk's tale. The Gaelic peoples seem to have established colonial realms on the west coast of Britain from the late 4th century onwards. In most of these, they appear to have merged into the culture of the local Brythonic peoples. But in the kingdom of Dalriata, founded by the Scotty warriors of Ulster, they began a slow cultural assimilation of the local Picts. Consequently, the modern nation of Scotland derives its name from the Scotty tribe, and the Scottish Gaelic language still spoken in the country today is a remnant of those Irish roots. However, it would neither be Pict nor Gael that would be the ultimate game changers of sub-Roman Britain. What exactly defines an Anglo-Saxon is a heated historiographic debate, but broadly speaking, they were a diverse amalgamation of tribes from Scandinavian and the North German coastline, primarily consisting of Angles, Saxons and Jutes. They were hardy warriors who spoke North Germanic languages and worshipped a pagan pantheon similar to the one made famous by the Norse Vikings centuries later. Amongst scholarly circles, the Wens, Howls and Whys of the Germanic migrations are topics of intense debate. According to Gildas, the burden of the Saxon tide falls upon the historically dubious Romano-British king named Vortigern. His reign was a tumultuous one. Faced with hordes of marauding Pictish raiders, Vortigern was forced to turn to soldiers of fortune from overseas. Accordingly, help came from the Germanic warriors of the North Sea, led by the Jutish brothers Hengist and Horsa. Gildas colors us with his opinion on this hiring. The British king and his counselors were so blinded that as a protection to their country, they sealed its doom by inviting wolves into the sheepfold. The fierce and impious Saxons, a race hateful to both God and men. Tradition has it that in the year 449, the brothers defeated the Picts, then promptly betrayed their Romano-British hosts, conquering a swath of southeastern Britain that would become the Kingdom of Kent. More Germanic migrants would follow in the brothers' wake, and by 500, it seemed as if the western half of England was firmly in Angle, Saxon or Jutish hands. These territories became known to the Celtic Britons as Kloiga, the Lost Lands. It was likely around this time that some Britons who lived on the island's southwest began taking to the seas in flight from the Germanic invaders. They established themselves in the Amorican Peninsula, the first of several waves of settlers to arrive in the region. Thus the peninsula became known as Brittany, after the Britons who settled it. Anecdotally, a region that had been Celtic-speaking in ancient times, but was then thoroughly Latinized by the Roman Empire, was re-Celticized by British refugees centuries later, and retains its Celtic language and identity to this day. The Saxons had established themselves in Britain, but it appears that for a time the natives were able to keep them contained by winning a series of military victories, led, if legend is to be believed, by a certain Dux Bellorum named Arthur. Herein lies the great mystery. Was Arthur a real historical figure? If he did exist, it was not amongst the knights, wizards and castles of the high medieval era but the spears and hill forts of sub-Roman Britain. The name first appears in a 6th century compendium of Welsh poems, known as the Gothodin. Here, a Briton hero named Guarador was described as not Arthur amongst equals in might of feats. This line implies that Arthur was a well-known figure to the 6th century Celts and was considered the benchmark for heroism in his age. Nennius, a Welsh monk writing in the 9th century, attributed 12 great battles to the semi-mythical warlord, the most triumphant one occurring in the early 500s AD at a place called Minith Bathon, generally considered to be modern-day Bath. Leading warriors from across the Brythonic kingdoms, the warlord of legend vanquished an army led by King Aelar of the South Saxons, thereby breaking Germanic power in Britain 
and delaying their advance for an entire generation. With that said, Nennius's accounts should be taken with a mountain of salt, as there's very little evidence that anyone named Arthur fought in any of the battles mentioned. Gildas, writing far closer to the time period in question, attributes Britain victory at Minoth Bathon not to Arthur, but to a Romanized commander named Ambrosius Aurelianus. With that said, when myth and folklore is stripped away, it does seem that, with or without Arthur's help, the Britons were able to fend off the Anglo-Saxons, albeit only temporarily. Within a few decades of Minith Bathon, the Anglo-Saxons had evidently recovered, with powerful kingdoms established deep in Kloiga, straddling the borders of unconquered Celtic lands. The Angles and Saxons who lived in these kingdoms were no longer transient invaders, but had lived in Britain for generations, working the same land their fathers and grandfathers had. In short, they were there to stay. Thus, in the second half of the 6th century, the forebears of the English began to push westwards once more, marching boldly into the lands of the men they called Wales, foreigners. In 577 AD, one King Caolin of the nascent Kingdom of Wessex met three British kings, Conmael, Condidan, and Farinmael, in a battle at Hinton Hill, near the modern township of Dirham. The Saxons routed the Celtic warriors, and as a result, Caolin was able to expand his territories right into the Severn estuary, severing the land connection between the Britons of Cornwall and Wales. This invariably led to a cultural drift between the newly separated Celtic territories, resulting in the common Brythonic spoken in those regions evolving into the separate languages of Cornish and Welsh. A few decades after the triumph of Saxon Wessex, the Angles of the North began a campaign of their own. King Ethelthrith of Bernicia carved a bloody path of conquest deep into northern Brythonic kingdoms like Regid, Elmet and Gothadin, and crushed the Gaelic king Adain Mac Gabrain at the Battle of Dexestan in 603 AD, establishing the Angles as the most dominant people north of the Humber. It must be noted that, in the land conquered by Germanic peoples, native Celtic culture was likely not entirely wiped away. The names of English kingdoms like Bernicia and Kent have Celtic origins, and some Briton blood likely ran through the veins of their earliest kings. The remains of brooch jewellery found in early Saxon graves have shown that the early Germanic settlers borrowed from the artistic traditions of the Britons. As for the Britons themselves, those who lived in the Kloiger were slowly assimilated into Anglo-Saxon culture over many generations. The line between Saxon and Celt was often more blurred than we think. Nevertheless, a frontier still existed between communities who spoke Old English and communities who spoke Brythonic and Gaelic. By the dawn of the 7th century, this frontier had become more or less entrenched, and would not move in any dramatic way for centuries. Be it by Roman or Germanic invaders, the Celts had lost much over the last thousand years or so. One can only wonder if a Welsh bowman in the 6th century AD, looking across a dike at a line of Saxon spears, would have been remotely aware of the fact that his ancestors' culture had once spread across an entire continent, a culture that was now confined to the westernmost edge of Britain. The days when Gallic hordes marched into the heart of Greece or duelled Roman legions from Spain to Turkey were long gone. But as territorially diminished as the Celts were, they would not go quietly into the night. As late antiquity transitioned into the Middle Ages, the stage was set for Europe's most enigmatic people to make their mark upon the medieval world. In the east, the ancestral home of the Brythonic peoples had fallen to Saxon invaders, but in the west, the heirs of Arthur would defy the rule of the nascent English people for centuries yet. Thus, the history of medieval Wales and her sister states in Cornwall, Brittany and Erhenogleth began. Meanwhile, with howling Picts and Northumbrians on their doorstep, the Gaels of Dalriata would write their own saga of blood and battle, eventually giving rise to the Kingdom of Scotland. Finally, across the narrow sea, Ireland would remain a relatively isolated land of internecine chieftains. But in time, the outside world would come knocking on their door, 
in the form of Vikings, Normans, and beyond. Indeed, the story of the Celts is not yet over. In fact, it has only just begun, and we'll continue telling it in the future, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see it. Please consider liking, commenting, and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the description. To know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord, and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.